Good morning. My name is Suhana, and I'm one of the amazing kids who are part of our Sunday morning children's program. I want to give a special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time this Sunday. Reverend Tim says that the most important person in the sanctuary is the person who is here for the first time. For many of us, it took courage to walk through the doors of this church or to invite this service into our home on Facebook or YouTube. We are glad you're here. So, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno, California. Welcome to our annual Dr. Martin Luther King Sermon. Welcome to everybody on our in-person church campus. Welcome to everybody on our online church campus. And welcome to everybody joining the service later on Facebook or YouTube. We are one congregation in many places. You are welcome no matter your age, race, spiritual background, or religious beliefs. Your neurodiversity is welcome here. You are welcome no matter your education or the amount of money you have. Your disabilities are welcome here. You are welcome no matter who you love or what your gender identity may be. You are welcome with or without documentation. All are welcome here. We acknowledge that our Alluvial Avenue campus sits on the traditional homeland of the Yokuts people, who are the past, present, and future to stewards of this land. If you are on our online campus and want your joys, sorrows, concerns, or gratitudes included in today's service, you can type it into the chat box. Please do it now so we have time to gather them to share later in the service. Just remember, don't text it. It's not working today. <laughs> now, in person, in the chat box, or in the quiet of our hearts, let's say, buenos dias to each other. As we prepare to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's 95th birthday, let's allow the sound of the tingsha to carry us to that quiet, tender place that truly believes it is possible to create love and justice for all.
lighting of the chalice this, mor uh, this morning, I have two important people helping me, and that is Timothy and Madison Bioto. Thank you for being here to light the chalice. We remember and celebrate today not only the great wisdom, leadership, courage, spirituality of Dr. Martin Luther King, but also of the many wise and courageous leaders who laid the foundation before him and with him. But our history does not acknowledge them. Without these other women and men, the stage would not have been set for this great orator. Most of us don't know their names, but today we light our chalice in gratitude to them and speak some of their name to summon their spirits and acknowledge their contributions to this holy purpose. <laughs> and as I name them, you can light the chalice. Ida Wells, Mary Church, W.E.B. Dubois, a. Philip Randolph, Ella Baker, Polly Miller, Bayard Rustin, Joanne Gibson Robinson, Dorothy Height, and Fanny Barrier Williams. So as we celebrate them, let's join together. If you can stand physically, or within your heart, please do so as we sing this little light of mine, mi pequeñita luz.
Let's remain standing as we say together the church's mission statement. La misión de la Iglesia Unitaria Universalista de Fresno es amar inclusivamente, crecer espiritualmente, servir con gratitud y trabajar por la justicia. The mission of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fresno is to love inclusively, grow spiritually, serve gratefully, and work for justice. Please be seated. So almost two years ago, this congregation voted to adopt an eighth principle or third value to our beloved seven principles. This is a principle that calls each of us to begin to understand and dismantle white supremacy culture within ourselves, within the congregation, and the dream in the world at large. Here's Ruth Jenkins reflecting on that mighty task. My life intersects with white supremacy culture in both nuanced and significant ways. I know I've benefited from white privilege. I grew up within the language and rules of institutions and cultures of power. They were familiar, comfortable. It wasn't until I began my career that I understood the danger and limitations of perpetuating those values. The idea, for instance, that objectivity existed when in fact it is simply the experiences and perspectives of those who have held power for generations. I've spent my adult life as a professor in academia at universities which have evolved from monastic communities where men devoted their lives to their vocation, where linear logical experiences were elevated as the norm. Objectivity was assumed. I learned though that the norm did not include female experience. Most striking for me was being told that if I wanted children, I really should have them over summer break. Institutional values have self-perpetuated for so long that their origins in white supremacy culture become invisible. So calling them out is made all the harder. It can be exhausting claiming space for your experience. And I am well aware that this is beginning from a foundation of privilege. Thank you, Ruth. So, Veronica, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind running to the sound booth to get the handheld mic for me. Oh, it's up here already? Oh, thank you, Mark. You anticipate our every need. Thank you. Let's hear it for Mark in the sound booth. So today we're going to have a lot of great music, and I've been thinking a lot about music and how it impacts our emotions, our spirits. I'm wondering if anybody here has a favorite or a favorite-ish song and would be willing to just let us know what that is. Does anybody have a favorite or a favorite-ish song? The Road in the Sky by Jackson Brown. And what does that so how does that song make you feel? Um, like I could do anything. Oh. Like I could do anything. Amen to that. And there was a, yes. Give yourself to love by Kate Wolf. And that just says it all. Give yourself to love. Amen to that. Oh, Kim, making me run to the back. Oh, you're running to join me. That's teamwork. What a wonderful world. Then it has to be sung by Louis Armstrong. <laughs> And, and it's because it's the way I want the world to be. Amen. We've got one more, one more, one more. Oh, yes. Lori. Okay, this uh, song makes me sad. Uh, Vincent by Don McLean. Yeah. Because, uh, yep. yeah, he was such a tortured soul. Sad. Yeah. And sometimes we want music that does sort of touch us in that way. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King had a favorite song, especially when he was feeling sad, when he was feeling worn down and weary. And that song, does anybody know what it was? No? Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And in fact, on some of the hardest nights, he would call Mahalia Jackson, a great, great singer, and she would sing it to him 
over the phone. Now, I know some of our kids may not be familiar with this song, so Lorenzo's going to do just a snippet, just to taste an appetizer. Precious Lord, take my hand. Thank you, Lorenzo. So, the civil rights movement and social justice movements use songs to lift people's spirit, to give them energy, to keep them marching on. Some of the, the favorite songs in the 60s were We Shall Overcome, um, I sh We Shall Not Be Moved, but songs continue to be written to be used by people like us to lift our spirits as we work for justice because we know that that is hard, hard work. So we're going to learn one of those right now that is a key song in the Poor People's Campaign, which is a campaign to bring poor people of color and poor white people together to become a new powerful force demanding justice. So I'm going to invite us to rise and body your spirit. And from our virtual campus, the Poor People's Campaign is going to teach us a song and then invite us to sing robustly. This song that we're about to learn is a song that's entitled, Somebody's Hurting My Brother. Now, this song was actually born in a town hall meeting around coal ash. And the meeting came about because Duke Energy was spilling coal ash into poor black and brown and poor white neighborhoods. After hearing testimony after testimony of people who were impacted physically and mentally by the coal ash, this song came as an inspiration of those testimonies. So I'll call to you, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on, and your response is, far too long. Yes, it's gone on. Far too long. It's gone on. Far too long. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on. Far too long. Now the end is, and we won't be silent anymore. We'll say that together. And, and we won't be silent anymore. Okay? And so we'll try the rehearsal version, which goes. Oh, oh, somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on far too long.
the Poor People's Campaign. Don't be silent. At this time, we're going to sing our kids off to spirit explorations where they're going to learn more about the songs of the civil rights movement. Let's sing them out as they head down the front to Veronica at the church doors. We hold you in our love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. Please be seated. Whew, a lot of moving and clapping. Let's take a nice deep breath in. Imagine that we are breathing in peace. And then we breathe out love. And again, a nice centering breath. Breathing in peace. We breathe out love. One last time together, breathing in the promise of peace. Breathing out, breathing out the necessity of love. As we continue breathing together, I invite you to for a moment, just claim the gift. One, you're alive. Two, you've lived for the last week, the last seven days. What did we do with that precious time? In the last week, did you offer understanding or compassion? When and to whom? Within our shared understanding and compassion, each Sunday we create space in our service to really honor the complexities of our lives, the emotions, the joys, sorrows, concerns, or gratitudes. Some of us wrote them in the chat box on our online campus. Others stopped at the small table at the entranceway to the sanctuary and wrote them on a card. This is just a little of what is alive among us today. Margaret from our online campus in the foothills offers gratitude to this wonderful congregation for donations made through Compassion and Action Animal Ministry of UU Fresno. We were able to donate $200 to ARF, the Animal Rescue of Fresno. Sharon is saying, just a reminder, stop by the social justice table and get your Black Lives Matter button for tomorrow's march. Laura R. has a joy. I'm joyful today because on my way to church, I was able to see the mountains. Hooray for rain! Colby also celebrating some weather-related things. Great gratitude to look east and see snow. Ellis here in the front row on our Alluvial Avenue campus is especially grateful and joyful that my son Stephen is here with me this Sunday on my 84th birthday. Much love to all. And Betty P. is feeling a sorrow today, the loss of three of her longtime RV families to the mysteries of death, Janice, Gabby, and Jim. And Betty also tempers that sorrow with joy, viewing snow in the mountains. 
We also remember our beloveds, those unable to be with us because of health or mobility. We remember first Andrew L., who was hospitalized last week and continues to be in the hospital. We remember Margaret H., Bev F., Glenda R., Pat M., and Babs E. We also extend our deepest appreciation to David Roberts and Addison for hanging up new, pristine Black Lives Matter banners on Friday in anticipation of celebrating Martin Luther King weekend. The weather had worn them down, so now they're quite bright and powerful. We also grieve today the fact that this week the UN declared that a quarter of the world is currently in drought conditions from Tunisia to Iraq, from the Sudan to the southwest US and beyond. This amount of drought is unprecedented in world history. Also, even as we grieve the many, many different wars worldwide, even as we grieve that over 100 Israeli hostages remain imprisoned by Hamas for 100 days, we grieve the UN announcement that every one in 100 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed in just over three months. Three-fourths of the civilian population have been displaced and many Palestinians trapped in Gaza now face starvation. For all that has been shared, for all that we hold in the precious tenderness of our own hearts, for all those who on this day have no one to remember them, no one to speak their name with gentleness or care, we light our candle of community by our remembering May we and they be blessed. Our call to meditation is meditation on breathing.
please join me in prayer. Great Spirit, we are saddened by news we see and hear, afraid of troubles anticipated, ashamed of our culpability, humbled by the courage of others who have suffered more and acted more. Grant us the energy to forgive ourselves and each other. Open our hearts to those we don't know. Listen to voices that can teach us. Understand stories that are not ours and act for justice even when feeling inadequate. Many have gone before us modeling love and bravery and conviction and will strive to follow their lead in our own way. Kea amen. ancestors and their ability to survive. My mother was often called a strong woman because as a single parent, she raised four children. My sister, brothers, and I frequently talk about how grateful we are for her strength, which resulted in the four of us having successful careers. When I read the book, Ain't I a Woman? by Bell Hooks, a black woman who was an activist, writer, and feminist, I was inspired and relieved. In the book, she said, and I quote, when feminists acknowledge in one breath that black women are victimized and in the same breath emphasize their strength, they imply that though black women are oppressed, they manage to circumvent the damaging, damaging impact of oppression by being strong. And that's simply not the case. Usually, when people talk about the strength of black women, they're referring to the way in which they perceive black women cope with oppression. They ignore the reality that to be strong in the face of oppression is not the same as overcoming oppression, that endurance is not to be confused with transformation. That quote both inspired and relieved me. 
It supported my continued efforts to guide students to examine business law and any other information they acquired with the critical eyes of analysis and the impact on what they learned on the human condition. But her words provided relief because they affirmed that there was a reason for the fatigue that enveloped me from time to time. When I believed I was weak because I was physically and mentally exhausted while fulfilling the demands of the profession and the responsibility of single parenthood, her words reminded me I actually wasn't without strength. I faced an additional challenge that white feminists did not, the burden of racism in addition to sexism. In her book, she acknowledged what I'd implicitly recognized, that I was enduring through the system and that endurance came at a physical and mental cost. She inspired me because it confirmed that I was a feminist fighting under the duality of, on the one hand, others heralding my success at arriving and as being treated as equal to men, and on the other hand, the reality that that sex success did not truly translate to transforming the system to be equal, but was instead evidence of my ability to endure through oppression. Bell Hooks was an insightful writer and feminist, and she helped me to understand the context of the world within which I live. Thank you for listening. I invite us to rise and body your spirit and join in a song that we sang many times during the worst of the pandemic. We sing it again. We rise. Hear it for stolen thunder.
I dare not cease to hope and aspire and believe in human love and justice. Could you say those words with me, please? I dare not cease to hope and inspire and believe in human love and justice. These words were spoken by one of the most influential black women in American history. She was one of America's most sought after speakers on justice and equity for black people and for extending to all women full citizenship and the right to vote. She was an unceasing advocate for equal access to education for black people. She was a noted reporter, one of the first black women working at white-run newspapers, including the Chicago Record Herald and the New York Age. She was an undisputed leader of the first wave of fe feminism in America in the late 1880s. The Washington Post proclaimed her one of the best-known black women on the continent. Her name was Fanny Barrier Williams. And that would be, yes, thanks. Fanny Barrier Williams. As outlined on the website Black Women's Suffrage, in 1887, she helped found the National League of Colored Women, an early precursor of the NAACP. In 1891, she helped found an interracial hospital that allowed for the training and employment of black doctors and nurses. In 1893, she spoke to the World Parliament of Religion and challenged white Christian denominations to end their sin of white supremacy. In 1895, in a blaze of controversy, she was the first black woman nominated and accepted into the prestigious all-white Chicago Women's Club. In 1907, she was the sole black person invited to offer a eulogy at the funeral of her friend, the legendary suffragist Susan B. Anthony. In 1909, she co-founded the NAACP. In 1924, she became the first black woman to sit on the Chicago Library Board until her death in 1944 at the age of 89 she was considered one of the leading feminist intellectuals of the time she was also a proud unitarian whose cherished religious values informed her life's work yes she was one of ours her name was fanny barrier williams and like so many black women who came before her and after her, her name has been virtually whitewashed from American history. And until recently, it had been virtually whitewashed from the history of Unitarian Universalism. And so today, we say her name loudly and proudly. Fanny Barrier Williams. Can you say that again? Fanny Barrier Williams. Her name is Fanny Barrier Williams, and she spoke these words that I believe we'll need to hold on to and repeat over and over as we move through the days, weeks, and months of what may very well be America's hardest year since the Civil War. I dare not cease to hope and aspire and believe in human love and justice. Fanny Barrier Williams was born in 1855 in Brockport in upstate New York, the youngest child of Harriet and Anthony Barrier. 
It was six years before the start of the Civil War. She was born into a family that she described as a mixed-race, light-skinned black family. Her family was the only black family in Brockport, but as she remembers it, she never experienced any prejudice, inequity, or racism. She wrote, quote, there could not have been a relationship more cordial, respectful, and intimate than that of our family and the white people of this community, end of quote. Beria Williams' biographer, Wanda A. Hendricks, notes, Brockport was an unsegregated society that encouraged social equality and insulated Fanny from the prevailing racist and sexist ideology that governed most black women's lives. Her father, Anthony, was a well-off merchant and real estate investor, and her mom was a homemaker. According to her biographer Hendricks, education was valued in the barrier household, and Fanny and her siblings were exposed to a broad array of opportunities to develop skills in writing, oratory, and the arts. Music was an important part of her educational experience, not only as art, but as a means of promoting happiness. At the age of 15, Fanny graduated from college. But as a teenager growing up in that sheltered environment of Brockport, New York, she never really understood that black people were treated as property or subhuman in much of the rest of the country. That changed forever in 1875, when at the age of 20, she left Brockport to teach at an elementary school job in Hannibal, Missouri. She arrived at one of the earliest public education facilities built for blacks when the state mandated racially segregated schools. Remember, this was post-Civil War, early Jim Crow South. Fanny Barrier Williams was stunned, horrified, and terrified by the brutality, hatred, and enforced segregation she experienced in Missouri. Biographer Wanda Hendricks says, in Hannibal, she was forced to acknowledge the gendered and raced constraints placed upon black women. Fanny Barrier Williams later wrote, quote, until I became a young woman and went south to teach, I had never been reminded that I belonged to an inferior race. Everything I learned and experienced in my innocent social relationships in New York State had to be unlearned. What a, what a shattering of cherished ideals. She continued, it was there for the first time I began life as a colored person and all that term implies. Summing up her experience, she concluded, I found that instead of there being a unity of life common to all intelligent, respectable, and ambitious people, down south life was divided into white and black lines, and that in every direction, my ambition and aspirations were to have no beginnings and no chance of development. Barrier Williams stomached this for two years, and then she fled back to the North, and for seven years taught school in Washington, D.C., where she immersed herself and flourished in D.C.'s wealthy, educated, cultured, black elite. 
But racism reared its head when, in 1884, Barrier Williams moved to Boston to begin studying music and art at the New England Conservatory of Music. Many white students and their wealthy parents objected to an integrated classroom. And as biographer Hendricks notes, she was asked to leave the conservatory. Barrier Williams later remembered, quote, even here in the very cradle of liberty, I was told that it would imperil the interests of the school if I remained. And again, I had to submit to the tyranny of the black complexion. It was there, at that moment in Boston, that Barrier Williams became determined to create the opportunity for black women to flourish intellectually and culturally, to allow black women's ambition and aspiration to unfold to the fullest extent of their human potential. Fanny returned to Washington, D.C., studying, writing, and teaching, and soon met her future husband, Samuel Lang Williams, through the black aristocratic circles they both inhabited. They were married in 1887 and relocated to one of the fastest growing regions in the country, Chicago. There, Fanny and Samuel joined the intentionally multiracial All Souls Unitarian Church, one of the most successful religious institutions in the city. In July of 1893, at the invitation of the church's minister, Fanny Barrier Williams stepped into the pulpit of All Souls Unitarian Church and preached her first sermon. She was sensational. And then came the moment the moment that changed history. That same year, 1893, Barrier Williams was one of three black speakers invited to address the week-long International Congress of the World's Women, part of the World's Fair, women from not just over the, all over the country, but all over the world gathered in Chicago. Barrier Williams took to the stage and declared, quote, less is known of black women than any other class of Americans. Then, according to historian Brittany C. Cooper, Barrier Williams issued America's first call for the systemic study of black women. Barrier Williams said, quote, no special literature reciting the incidents, the events, and all things interesting and instructive about black women are to be found, end of quote. Black women are invisible as human beings. Barrier Williams declared it was time to make visible the experience, emotion, thought, and voice of black women and bring them into the center of American social and political discourse. Author Brittany Cooper writes, Barrier Williams told those gathered, quote, Black women were ambitious to be contributors to all great moral and intellectual forces that make for the greater good of our common country. In no uncertain terms, Barrier Williams informed the audience that black women wanted a stake in intellectual leadership, not only of their race, but also their country. That speech catapulted her to national fame. 
For the next four decades, Fanny Barrier Williams worked to lay part of the national foundation out of which the later civil rights movement of the 60s would rise, and just as importantly, out of which the second wave of black feminism would rise in the 1960s and 70s. She devoted four decades to writing, publishing, reporting, speaking, teaching, mentoring, and inspiring black women to claim their worthiness and their voice. The greatest and most lasting contribution Fanny Barrier Williams made was through her co-founding the National Association of Colored Women in 1896. As Britley Cooper notes, it was a network of over 400 national clubs which acted as a training ground for the first generation of black women public intellectuals. Barrier Williams said, quote, the first thing to be noted is that these club women are students of their own social condition. The clubs themselves are schools in which are taught and learned the lessons of life and living. In all of them, race problems and sociological questions directly related to the condition of the black race in America are the principal subjects for study and discussion. But then, she believed, this knowledge needed to be shared widely. Author Cooper notes, the club women actively embrace their role as creators of public knowledge about African Americans in general and African American women in particular. Fanny Barrier Williams argued that these women were needed to change the idea of things implanted in the minds of the white race and hardened into national habits. These women were needed as an educator of public opinion, a refutation of the insinuations and skepticism as to the womanly worth and promise of a whole race of women. Unitarian Fanny Barrier Williams and those early black feminists who followed paved the way for the powerful public black women who have shaped and are shaping today's American society and the ongoing struggle for liberation. Black women such as Zora Neale Hurston, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Angela Davis, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, Roxanne Gay, Patrice Con Colors, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, Tarana Burke, Maxine Waters, Katanji Brown Jackson, Marley Dias, Stacey Abrams, Yara Shahidi, Imani Perry, Amanda Gorman, and so, so, so many others, all the heirs of the Fanny Barrier Williams legacy. They are all part of Fanny Barrier Williams' vision of the women who would come after her. Black women she knew, she knew would come of age and rise into their power. Perhaps that vision is what allowed her to declare, as we too must declare, I dare not cease to hope and inspire and believe in human love and justice. Heia si sea, bendito sea. May it be so, blessed be. Amen.
Cos. Si a me cu canyen quen cos. Si a me cu canyen quen cos. Si a me cu canyen quen cos. Si a me cu cos. Si a me cu canyen cos. Si a me cu canyen cos. Caminando en la luz de Dios, caminando en la luz de Dios, caminando en la luz de Dios. Caminando en la luz, en la luz de Dios, caminando, vamos caminando, vamos caminando en la luz, en la luz de Dios, caminando, vamos caminando, vamos caminando en la luz de Dios. We are marching in the light of the We are marching in the light of love. We are marching in the light of love. We are marching in the light of love. We are marching, marching, we are marching, marching, we are marching in the light of love. We are marching. Marching, we are marching, we are marching in the light of love. 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 We are marching. was uplifting. Um, it's Second Sunday. We all know what that means, right? We're recognizing an, a social justice organization that's aligned to Unitarian Universalist principles, and our offering does go to that organization. And I think most of you would say this newspaper looks familiar. Um, Community Alliance has been the voice of the progressive um, moment, uh, movement since 1996. And the person we can thank for that uh, is Mr. Mike Rhodes, who has come to speak to us today. Well, the most important thing I have to say today is to thank you for your support of the Community Alliance newspaper. Without that support, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, we have been publishing for 27 years. And we also appreciate that you have our paper here at the social justice table every week. That's, that's important to have access to a free and independent paper. And sometimes we, don't realize how valuable it is to have a paper whose mission is to build a progressive movement for social and economic justice. Our purpose is not to make money, although we have to make some to pay the printer. Uh, it is, the goal is to support groups who are working for people earning a living wage for environmental justice to stop the hate. You know, we are mission driven and we need the support of the community. We've always had it. It's always pulled us through. <clears throat> One of the 
Um, one of the things I want to say is that in the future, we realize that having a newspaper only is not enough, that young people get most of their news through social media. If we are to grow and continue in this community, we need to develop a social media presence. It's our intention to hire a young social media director who can reach out to those young people and bring them into the work that we're doing. And with your support, ongoing support, we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike, for your hard devotion, hard work. All right, so please join in our chalice extinguishing words. Oh, no, wait, I gotta tell you about how to give us money, right? <laughs> I turned the page too quickly. All right, in this spirit, please join me in our words of offering. If not us, then who? If not open hearts, then what? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? If not generously, then how? If not us, then who? There's a slide coming up here that will show you how to make a contribution right now on the virtual campus, or if you're here on the alluvial campus, you can always drop whatever you wish, not your firstborn child, in the basket as you exit. Um, you can also share generously through Cash App. I finally downloaded that, and, and it's so easy. It's wonderful, so give that a try. Thank you all in advance for contributing to the continuance of the gift that you all are, this congregation. Now, we're gonna go to Chalice Extinguishing. So, please join me in the Chalice Extinguishing words. Extinguimos esta llama para no la luz de la verdad, el color de comunidad, o el fuego de nuestro compromiso. Estos los llevaremos en el corazón. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts. So as uh, we prepare for the closing, Tim has just a few reminders for us. I do. First, let's thank Jimmy Haney, our special <laughs> musical guest today. We always love it when you are here. So, just quickly, if you are new or newish to this church community, the person you need to know is Cecily Callahan, our coordinator of community life. She is the staff member who is charged with helping you get connected and getting a sense of belonging. Speaking of connection and belonging, outside, it'll be a tad bit chilly, but the heaters will be on. We'll be having coffee hour immediately at the end of the service. You will see a table with blue turquoise uh, tablecloth and a sign that says visitors. That's our question and answer table. If you get your cup of coffee and go there, there will be somebody eagerly waiting to talk with you as a new person within our community. Also happening after the service today at 1215, we'll be showing the film Creation and Catastrophe, 1948. It's a documentary that shares firsthand accounts from the creation of Israel and the subsequent expulsion of the Palestinians. A brief discussion will follow. Having spent time in the West Bank, some of the folks who were interviewed for this film, I actually met while I was there. Also, and we will have snacks for you as well, and that film will start at 12 15. Tomorrow, we hope you'll join us for Fresno's annual Martin Luther King March. We're going to gather around 9.30, 9.45 with a 10 o'clock kickoff of the parade at St. John's Cathedral on Mariposa. 
Also, next Sunday, please remember, it is our food offering for families in the El Dorado Park neighborhood and for families in Valley Children's Hospital. We need canned beans, pasta, soups, any food that can be microwaved, as well as granola bars and fruit or vegetable cups. Please pick up a food strip in the baskets on your way through the sanctuary as you leave and bring those with you next week. Last but certainly not least, coming up in mere weeks is this magical moment, our annual auction, and by the glory of the virtual campus, please welcome Valerie and Shelley, who are also live in our Alluvial Avenue campus. They are two places at once. Hi, I'm Shelley Glassroot. And I'm Valerie Johnson. We're the co-chairs of the biggest fundraiser of the year, this magic moment. We're here to remind you about our exciting auction on February 4th through 11th. You'll be getting an email this week with a link to the auction. This is a great opportunity to go in and register. If you participated last year, no need to re-register, but if you didn't, take care of it now. I'll remind you that you can't start bidding till February 4th. But we need donations like gift cards to restaurants, bookstores, a Zoom membership, art. You get the idea. If you don't have an idea, we have lots of them. <laughs> Look for that email this week and register. We can't do this without you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Valerie and Shelley. And I gently pass you back to Lori. Now I've got it. As we prepare to end the service, uh, we wanna just acknowledge those of you who have been here. Maybe this is your first time or second or third. We'd just like to recognize you and acknowledge you and thank you for being here this morning. It won't last long, I promise. So if you wouldn't mind standing for just one moment. Yay! Yay. Thank you so much. Everybody else, join them, please. And now if all of us in the virtual world and here in person would rise and place your hands over your hearts for our closing words. For me, this has been a deepening and challenging service. Immersing in the stories, the words of our dear Ida Jones and Miss Fanny Barrier Williams. As we prepare to close this service, let's remember the words of Ms. Williams once again and believe this in our hearts because we need this right now. I dare not cease to hope and inspire and believe in human love and justice. Let us live these words and the example set forward to love and to serve justice through the coming days, months, years. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Say that. Anyway, have a good day. <laughs>